Welcome to Tokyo Game Life, a Tokyo based video game podcast focusing on Nintendo and gaming culture in Japan's capital. Your host, Mono, here to bring you a slice of gaming life from Tokyo. Nintendo superfan Zalman joins the podcast as we highlight the Famicom Detective Club series. From a Japan only Famicom disc system game to Nintendo's recent worldwide release of Emio, The Smiling Man, we explore Nintendo's fascination with adventure games and, of course, who should be in Smash Brothers. In the game section, I break down the newly released The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom Masterworks book. Is the timeline solved? No, but I promise there's a lot to talk about. And finally, I'll end with the many, many news items from these past few days. Let's get into the feature on the Famicom Detective Club series with Zalman. Today's feature is on the Famicom Detective Club series, a once Japan-only Nintendo franchise that has found new life these past few years on the Switch, including the recently released Emio the Smiling Man. Joining me to chat all about this mysterious franchise is a special guest. So guest, please introduce yourself. Yes, hello, my name is Zelman, uh, also simply known as Zell. You may have seen me on Twitter and on various other Discord sites, servers, and I'm happy to finally be on Tokyo Game Life. So. It's been a long time coming, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Like I said before we recorded, when I think of Famicom Detective Club, I think of only one person, and that's mm -hmm. you. So for those unfamiliar with the series, give us the basics. What is the Famicom Detective Club series? Sure. Famicom Detective Club is a text adventure visual novel style series. And what's unique about it is it was developed internally at Nintendo for the Famicom. Mm. And that is in itself very unique because Nintendo doesn't usually make these kinds of games. And not only that, but they are spearheaded by Yoshio Sakamoto of Metroid fame nowadays. So you will see some of the same influences actually from the Metroid series in this series. Do you remember how you first became aware of the series? Yes. So I would say in the late 2000s is when I started getting into this genre of games. Just like many others, I got into Ace Attorney first. And as soon as I played Ace Attorney, I, I was hooked and I started playing more and more visual novels, text adventure games. And ar around the same time, I started becoming more aware of the game industry and I started doing more research on the developers and the classic series. And I stumbled upon Famicom Detective Club at the time. And what really caught my eye was the fact that it was Nintendo developed and it was written by Sakamoto. And mm. I also realized at the time, Ayumi is actually a trophy in Smash Melee, which you yes. know, <laughs> Melee is a, a game that I played back in the day, but you know, I didn't really think about it too much back then. Mm. Uh, so all the pieces kind of fell into place at the time. And I was, at the time I was just thinking, you know, maybe one day I'll get the opportunity to play these, but it wasn't really looking good at the time. So I kind of forgot about it for a while. And then when they announced it for the Switch, obviously that was the perfect opportunity. Yeah, me as well. I think the first time I encountered the series was definitely Ayumi Tachibana's trophy in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which I think is a pretty common origin story for many people. And one of the many strange, really deep cut characters represented in the game with a fantastic 3D model. But let's flesh out a bit of history. The basic premise is that you work for a detective agency and solve mysteries by interacting with other characters and the environment. The first game, Famicom Detective Club, The Missing Air, was released on the Famicom Disk System. Uh, so not just the Famicom, the actual disc yes. system, in 1988, followed by a prequel the next year titled The Girl Who Stands Behind. And both games were on two discs, which was somewhat rare for the Famicom disc system. And yes, the most notable alumni from the dev team is, of course, Yoshio Sakamoto, who is most known as the arbiter of the Metroid series. And Famicom Detective Club is a classic Japanese-style adventure game, similar to the Portopia serial murder case, which was popular around this time. You mentioned it a little bit earlier about the Metroid connection. So what would you say are the standout elements of the Famicom Detective Club series? So if you think of Metroid, Metroid is probably one of the darker Nintendo franchises. You mm, will notice yeah. some horror elements in Metroid, and you will see that in Famicom Detective Club as well. And actually, Emio is rated M, or Peggy 18 in Europe. So you, will de you definitely see that it has like a darker edge to it. Yeah, I think people often compare this type of game to Layton or Ace Attorney due to their mix of text-heavy narrative and puzzle solving. But would you say Famicom Detective Club is a bit lighter on the puzzles and heavier on the story compared to those games? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it does have some puzzles, but the puzzle in Famicom Detective Club is actually how you proceed the conversations. 
because mm. in Ace Attorney, you get specific dialogue options and it tells you when that option is done, when you can move on to a different option. But Famicom Detective Club, it doesn't really tell you that. So you have to kind of figure out yourself what to ask the person to get more information. And that is kind of maybe controversial part of this series. It can be a bit obtuse because you have to guess sometimes what you need to do. But I've actually grown to like it because it's unique, especially in this day and age. You don't really see visual novels do this anymore. And also it allows for some player freedom, which obviously I will not spoil anything about this game. But (laughs) there are some interactions in this game that only happen if you do certain things. So it's Mm. very interesting that way because there's a lot of Easter eggs. And these Easter eggs would not be possible if it worked like an Ace Attorney game, for example. Did you ever try out the original Famicom Disk System games? Or what was your first experience actually playing the franchise? No, I did not. My first experience was the remakes. Did you ever go back and try the Disk System games just for fun? No, I I would actually like to just to compare. But obviously they were in Japanese. Maybe I can find some (laughs) translation out there. But no, I've not Mm. gone back to it, no. The series actually has a pretty robust release history. And like with any great niche Nintendo franchise, it has a Satellaview game, a remake of The Girl Who Stands Behind, and a brand new adventure titled BS Yukinikieta Kako, where you only play as Ayumi Tachibana. But this game was a bit more experimental than the other two, since it was a sound link game, which meant it was fully voice acted, but it had limited actual input from the player. Have you ever messed with any of the Satellaview games? No, I have not. And I'm actually curious because they seem to not want to acknowledge its existence, which is interesting to me Mm. because just a few days ago before the release of Emio, a Nintendo released developer interview with Sakamoto and Miyachi also from Nintendo. And none of them ever mentioned the Satellaview game. (laughs) They just pretended, Mm. oh, there were two games and now there's this third one, right? (laughs) So it it makes me uh, wonder like, How involved was Sakamoto in this? I don't actually know. I believe he was Mm. uh, credited as the producer, but was he like the main writer or was it someone else? I'm not actually sure about that, but for some reason, they're not really doing anything with that game, which is unfortunate because, you know, you play as Ayumi in that game, which is interesting. In Mm. Emio, you do actually have some uh, Ayumi segments, which is nice, but the fact that she got her own game and we're not getting that brought over is kind of a shame. We just have to wait for the Satellaview NSO app. Yes. <laughs> that will launch any second now. And beyond the Satellaview games, the first two titles did get ported to the GBA in Japan. And it's shown up on various eShops over the years, but again, only in Japan. But lo and behold, in 2021, Nintendo and Tokyo developer Mages, mostly known for the science adventure series, including Steins Gate, uh, remade the first two games for a worldwide release, marking the first time the series has ever hit the West. Uh, What were your thoughts on the Switch remakes of the first two games? Yeah, so I don't know if you remember this, but initially this was only announced in a Japanese Direct. Mm, And I remember thinking, man, that's such a shame. I would love to play these. (laughs) And then I believe they were delayed in Japan, like quietly. And then one day they showed up again and they announced that they were coming to the West as well. So I assume they probably changed their minds at some point, which is nice. And so they got a global simultaneous release and that was really cool. And I am familiar with some of Mage's work. I have played Steinscape. So I knew like these guys are good at making this genre of games and it was a match made in heaven. So I was really excited about that. Yeah, it was amazing to see Nintendo revive this series after so long. In a recent dev interview, Sakamoto said the origin of the project came from really just a super fan at Mages. So it's pretty amazing to see this small company, at least relative to Nintendo, was able to completely revive a Nintendo franchise and give it a worldwide release. Though I did see some criticism of the games, saying that compared to a lot of other adventure titles, it was fairly basic in how you interact with the game and that it does feel like an NES game in a lot of ways. Is this a fair criticism or is that just part of the charm of the series? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, As I mentioned before, uh, it it does uh, play a little bit differently than modern visual novel games in the sense that it doesn't really tell you what to do. And Mm. that can be a bit frustrating when you just want to proceed and you keep trying the same menu commands and nothing's happening. But I've grown to like it. I think it's part of the charm and it does allow for some freedom and some... You know, it's kind of like a puzzle in itself. So I Hmm. I think it's cool. Do you have a preference between the two games? Which one is your favorite? The two originals. The Girl Who Stands Behind is a little more unique. I think Hmm. The Missing Air is more of a traditional whodunit type of murder mystery. Whereas The Girl Who Stands Behind is a little more unique to me. And it's also 
more horror focused. And okay. I believe in the recent interview, Sakamoto said that he believed that one was mostly his, whereas he got some outside influences that influenced that game in some ways. Whereas the girl who stands behind was fully like, this is what I want to do type of thing. And you can kind of tell because again, it is a little more horror inspired, just like Emio is. But yeah, I think it's not really night and day for me. I like both games pretty evenly. How would you describe Sakamoto's writing? Of course, he's mostly famous for being a designer and a director, but do you think he has a very specific writing style or what would you say are some elements of Sakamoto's writing? I think hmm, it's it's hard to say because, you know, yes, he has made a lot of games over the years. He's one of the old guard from Nintendo, you know, Nintendo Legends, mm. but you don't really associate him too much with writing, right? Obviously, he, yeah. he caught some flack for Other M at the time, <laughs> but I don't, I don't really associate him with writing. Typically, it's really just Famicom Detective Club. So it's, it's really hard for me to pinpoint his style. Again, it is horror-inspired, as I have said. All right, we've gotten into the history, into the recent games, but let's get into the big boy, Emio. A few weeks after the June Nintendo Direct, they cryptically tweeted out, who is Emio, with a short video. Now, at this time, did you know it was a Famicom Detective Club game? You know, it did cross my mind at one point, but I didn't think about mm. it too much. So when the remakes came out, there was an interview with one of the leads for the game. And he was saying how he wanted to do a brand new original Famicom Detective Club game. So this was in 2021. Mm. So it was always like in, in the back of my mind. And I believe it was earlier this year in January when Mages, they started talking about their plans for this year. And... They were mm. talking about they were doing this big Steinsgate anniversary celebration. And then aside from that, they said there was a big game coming, like some big announcement. And I remember reading that earlier this year, thinking that's probably Famicom Detective Club. But again, I just forgot about it. And I didn't think too much about it when, when the MEOTs came out. But then the week after when they did announce what it was, I, I was surprised, I will admit. I did not see it coming. Yeah, I did see some people guess that it was going to be Famicom Detective Club, but it never really crossed my mind. So I was pretty surprised when they revealed, oh, Emio is the next entry in the Famicom Detective Club series. What did you think about this marketing strategy overall? Would it have been better to include it in a Nintendo Direct or was this the way to go? Oh, I think this was perfect. It really caught a lot of mm. traction online and it, it was really funny to see how the mainstream media was uh, disappointed when they found out what it really was. <laughs> but I thought it was awesome because it really, if you look at the number of views on that video, initial video, I believe it's like half a million. That would not happen if they just had announced it as a Famicom Detective Club game. So I think it, it was a smart move. Yeah, I definitely think it would have gotten buried in the Nintendo Direct if they did Marvel vs. Capcom is coming back and then MEO and then Zelda <laughs> back to yeah. back. I think a lot of people are forgetting about Famicom Detective Club. Sad, sad to say, but I really like the marketing strategy. And I would definitely love to see Nintendo do it more in the future. I also want to talk about the way they did this demo for the game, which I thought was really awesome because, you know, I'm not the type of person who usually plays demos that far in advance because I want to play the whole thing right. uh, when it comes out. But I did like the fact that they were doing like one chapter every couple of days leading up to the release. So I was like, oh, okay, I, I can be a part of this. So that was really fun for me because I played chapter one and then I read people's theories and, and people had so many different wild theories about this game. And I couldn't even mm. discount any of them because I had no idea where this game would go. And Sakamoto did warn us in advance that this game probably would have a controversial ending. So I was like, mm. I have no idea what's going to happen in this. So all these theories valid at this point, right? So chapter two came out, the same thing. And then chapter three. And it was really fun to be a part of that ride for me. Obviously, not too many people are actually playing this game. It's pretty niche still. But it was like a small community right. of, of players who played this game every couple of days and then shared their theories, which was, I thought, that was really cool to be a part of. Yes, Emio, the Smiling Man Famicom Detective Club came out just a few days ago. And this time you hunt down a serial killer with a distinct smiling mask. You told me before we recorded, you have completed it. So what are your overall thoughts on the game? Yes, I completed it four or five hours ago, and so it's still fresh in my mind. But, you know, I have to process it, but I'm confident in saying it's my favorite in the series. That's for sure. Mm. I guess without getting into spoilers, like you said earlier, this is an M-rated game. The first in the franchise and a rare Nintendo published M-rated title. Would you say it earns its M rating or were you scratching your head about why it got that mark? I was scratching my head for the longest time. 
but the closer you mm. get to the end, the more you understand it. Mm. Another interesting element about the game is that while the original titles took place in that time period, this one is now a period piece as it takes place in the, in the late 80s. Do you think they lean into the 80s setting at all, or is it just kind of an afterthought? They kind of do. I'm not sure actually how this would have worked if it took place in the modern day with you know social media mm. and all that. They would have to rewrite the whole script. There is, you do have a phone in this game, but it's an old school phone. So mm. I, I do think they lead into that 80s, 90s vibe, which I think is cool. Do you actually ever see a Famicom in the Famicom Detective Club games? I don't recall ever seeing one, no. Maybe there's one hidden <laughs> somewhere, but I, I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. I wish they called themselves the Famicom Detective Club in the game. That would just be a, a funny thing to introduce yourself as, but yes. uh, maybe in the next one they can do yes. that. Compared to the other two Switch games, are there any new interesting gameplay mechanics, I guess without getting into spoilers? Because I have heard, oh, they're hiding a lot of gameplay elements that you might not expect, but is the way you interact with the game pretty much the same as the other titles from Mages? It's pretty much the same as the other Famicom Detective Club games, I would say, uh, which hmm. was a little surprising to me because, you know, it is an old school way of navigating a visual novel. But I actually, I, I do notice that they have streamlined it a little bit. Hmm. It's more obvious what you have to do. So they're not completely giving it away, but they are leaning you towards the right direction. So I think that's actually a good balance. More specifically, what they do is they highlight some of the text to hint what you need to do next. And you can actually turn this off if you want to in the options, which is nice. But yeah, that does make it less obtuse, which is good. But overall, gameplay-wise, it's the same as the previous ones. Was there anything you wish they would have added or streamlined even further? No, actually, no. I think I'm, I'm pretty content with mm. it, yeah. The game reviewed quite well, definitely above the first two remakes. And many people have even been saying it's one of the best game stories they've ever encountered. I have even see a few people dub it Game of the Year. So there's definitely a subset of people who are really, really into the game. What's Emio doing that elevates it over the other two games? I think what it does differently or better is too early to say for me. I need to really think about this game. I'm still processing it. Mm. But I will say in terms of game of the year, it's probably the game that has impacted me the most this year. And so I could see it being my personal game of the year. This year, Nintendo put out Emio and Another Code Recollection, two very classic style Japanese adventure games. And the aforementioned Layton and Ace Attorney have close ties with Nintendo platforms. Why do you think Nintendo is so invested in the adventure genre? It's kind of hard to imagine Sony or Microsoft funding a game like this. Yeah, I think that's just Nintendo, the way they are. One thing that Nintendo has been really good at in the Switch generation is they are investing in the most niche franchises that you would not expect anyone to invest mm. in, uh, especially not a big publisher like Nintendo. Like, who greenlights a big budget visual novel in 2024? That's crazy. That's what makes Nintendo special to me, that they are willing to do this because the, the trend in the industry is we're going to make fewer games, but we're going to make bigger games. And Nintendo mm. is just the opposite of that. The fact that they can release these games at a pretty quick pace, that, that's unbelievable. I'm not sure if they're fond towards visual novels specifically, or I think it's just mm. that they want to have a variety of genres. But I do remember there was an investor Q&A a couple of years ago where they were asked about this genre, visual novels. And Miyamoto actually answered that and saying how he was a big fan of Ace Attorney, Professor Layton, that people were doing a good job with the genre, but it's really hard to invest in because there's so much text that needs to be translated. And there's an expectation of, should we have voice acting in this? Does that need to be localized too? So it's not a cheap thing to produce, actually. So the fact that they're still doing it is awesome. Yeah, I think just even programming the logic about you know what activates this dialogue box is very, very complicated. There's a lot going under the hood than a lot of people realize. And speaking of voice acting, this has only Japanese voice acting, correct? That's correct. Would you have liked an English dub or do you prefer the Japanese voices? I, I, I'm okay with the Japanese voices, but I do think that if they want it to be a little more mainstream, it would have been nice mm. to have an option for a dubbed version. But again, I know that they probably know this is not a game that's going to sell gangbusters. So the fact that we got this at all in the West is really cool. So I'm okay with the Japanese voices personally. I think it adds to the vibe. Yeah. And going back to what Miyamoto said, I can definitely kind of understand the appeal of adventure games for Nintendo because they are really games anyone can play. Nintendo, of course, they're really wide reaching in getting casual gamers, people who really don't play games 
And I'm sure there's a subset of gamers who they only play adventure games, or they only play visual novels. And yeah, these people are coming to the Switch because that's the place to play these games. So even if there's only a few hundred thousand people who are really, really into these games, they are willing to buy a Switch to play these types of games, which I think is an interesting strategy that not a lot of other companies think about. Yes. And I saw a tweet earlier. Uh, someone said, this feels like a game you greenlight when you are at the top of the industry, right? Like you are, uh, <laughs> yeah. like everyone has a switch at this point. Why not just make this game? And then it's going to sell fine mm -hmm. and we're going to make money off of it. It's not going to be a, a huge success, but people will be happy. And I think that's cool. Did you see the Nintendo Tokyo Emio merch? And what are you picking up? Yes, I saw that. Not going to pick up any of that, but I really appreciate it uh, that they actually went the extra mile with this. So that was cool. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. You never really know if a game will get merch or not. But for listeners, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a keychain of like a cartoon Emio. And there's also like an Emio bag. That's like his head or I guess his mask. So you can wear a tote bag of Emio's mask. Although I guess it's technically upside down since the opening is on the top mm -hmm. and the, the bottom is closed. And there is an Emio shirt as well, which is not available, but it is coming soon. I think Sagamoto has a lot of power here because I remember Metroid <laughs> Dread also got merch, which, you know, mm. Metroid is not really a series they do a lot of merch on. So yeah. that, that was cool to see as well. I, I, I would like to see Famicom Detective Club Amiibo, but I, they, mm. they seem to like not do as many Amiibos th these days. So maybe we'll have to wait for Ayumi to join Smash to get an Amiibo of her. <laughs> there is a small Metroid section in Nintendo Tokyo. It doesn't have like a big stat or anything, but there is like a, a Metroid mm. Isle. I'm really curious, where are they putting the Emio merch inside the store? Like, is it next to the Animal Crossing stuff or where is it? So I'll try to go there just to see where they're putting yes. it. For people who want to get into the Famicom Detective Club series, uh, where do you recommend they start? Should they just jump in with Emio or try out the other two games first? I always think it's nice to start from the beginning. You can easily jump into Emio, but I do think you get a little more out of it if you play the others. Thankfully, though, these are all pretty short games, so you can get through these. I think they're about 10 hours each, but they are standalone stories, so you don't really have to worry about missing out on significant details. It's just like an extra little mm. thing. Okay, final question. Who should be in Smash? Ayumi Tachibana or Emio or a different character? I do think Ayumi deserves it. I mm. think that would be cool. Have you thought about her moveset yet? What should be her final Smash? I've not thought about that. This is one of those characters where you have to be creative, but mm -hmm. that's the fun of Smash, right? Like anyone can join Smash yeah. and, and you can f come up with a cool moveset for it. I think that's Sakurai's job, not mine. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe like the final Smash, you could be in like a text box or something, like the original Famicom Disk System menu layout and they bounce around or something. Yeah, I think Sakurai smarter than both of us. So I'm sure he'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah, and like, I would like to see, I'm a big supporter of Phoenix Wright in Smash as well. And Capcom mm. made that work in Marvel vs. Capcom. So I do think there yeah. is a, a way for sure. Yeah, Sakurai can always find a way. He just makes up characters like Mr. Game & Watch and exactly. <laughs> turns them into masterpieces. So yes. hopefully we'll see a Famicom Detective Club character playable or at least an assist trophy or something. Yes, so. I would like to see this franchise be a little more integrated into the overall Nintendo community. And I think Smash would be mm. a good way to do that. Mm. I'm a big fan. Like, for example, sometimes on YouTube, at least I see these two hour long videos, which are just compilations of songs from different Nintendo series. And I never see mm. any Famicom Detective Club on those. And I'm like, they deserve to be on these playlists too, right? Uh, the soundtracks are phenomenal. Mm. One thing that I was worried about with Emio was actually the soundtrack, but I'm happy mm. to say that it's really good. It definitely lives up oh, to... Great the old games, it might actually be better than the old games. I know that the composer is uh, Takeshi Abo, who works with mages on the science adventure games. So he, mm. he always does a fantastic job and Emio is no different. So yeah, I, I would love to see Famicom Detective Club Amiibo. I would like to see them in Smash. I would like to see, yeah, just more integrated, you know, because they are a core part of Nintendo's history. I do have actually one more question. Uh, what do you think is the future of the Famicom Detective Club series? Do you think Mages is going to make a new one every three years, or is it going to be on the back burner for a while, depending on the sales of Emio? Or what do you see the future of the series like? I get the sense that they were happy with the remakes, how they perform. Mm. Just the fact that they're doing a physical copy in the West for Emio uh, tells me that they were satisfied. And I think Emio will do even better because the marketing has been so good. So hopefully, this is 
not the end, but start a new era for this series. I would like to see mm. every three, four years, a new Famicom Detective Club. I think if they're down, I think Nintendo is down. And also in the recent uh, developer interview, they were talking about how Miyachi from Nintendo could take over the series somehow. They were kind of mm. teasing yes. it. So I think <laughs> they are open to the possibility. So I sure hope so. Yeah, I definitely think it's a possibility. And I think they might make one just to have somebody in Smash. They're going to run out of characters one day. So you might as well just keep making games to fill out that roster. I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> so that was a look at the Famicom Detective Club series. MEO is out there right now. So stay on the lookout. Uh, Zalman, where can people find you? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at Interzalman. Uh, I tweet about video games, news, opinions, jokes, all that stuff. So feel free to connect. And uh, yeah, that's it. Great. And the link will be in the podcast description. So listeners, check it out. Zalman, once again, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Today's game session is not about a game at all, but instead a book. Yes, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom Masterworks, a comprehensive overview of that game that's part art book, part development diary, and part lore dump. Breath of the Wild also had a similar book, which was titled Masterworks in Japan, but creating a champion in English. So this is the, I suppose, sequel to that book. What would the localized title for this one be? Summoning a Sage? It's got to have alliteration, right? I mean, Masterworks is already a pretty good title, so I don't really think we need to change it, but, you know, localization is localization. Tears of the Kingdom is easily the most discussed game on this podcast, but I still don't feel like I've even scratched the surface regarding why this game is great and why it connects with me. Basically, if I could snap my dream game into existence, it would be exactly like Tears of the Kingdom. So a huge book dedicated to what I consider probably the greatest game ever made. Easy day one by. As of this recording, it hasn't been announced for the West, but yeah, I mean, it's coming. Considering how much text is in the book, I know a lot of people are probably waiting for the English translation instead of just importing it. But thankfully, I can at least provide a bit of a preview of what to expect when it comes overseas. The book is published by Ambit, which owns the Japanese Nintendo magazine, Nintendo Dream. I did a feature on Nintendo Dream on the podcast before, but for those unaware, it is basically the Japanese version of Nintendo Power, but Nintendo is a bit more hands-off than it was with Power. But the people actually writing the book are the Nintendo Dream editorial staff, but of course with overview from Nintendo. Like Hyrule Historia or Creating a Champion, it's a huge book you could easily incapacitate somebody with, as it's filled with 464 glossy pages of colorful art, detailed descriptions of the world, and an interview with the developers. A big game requires a big book. The cover design is fantastic, featuring the Zonai green hand symbol on black and gold circles. And these are based on the Japanese Samon circles in Zid Gardens to symbolize waves. The circles also have some texture to them, so it's fun to just run your fingers all over it but eventually you're going to want to actually open the book. There are three core sections, artworks, which features official art from the game, making, which focuses more on concept art and designing the new elements of the game, and history, which focuses on the lore and setting of Tears of the Kingdom's Hyrule. Depending on who you are, you might be excited for one over the other. I'm definitely a making guy. I want to see that rough concept art, unused sketches, and read about all the inspiration for the different design elements. The book opens up with these stone murals you see at the start of the game, so some great synergy there. One thing you'll immediately notice is that the pages have a great thickness and texture to them. They don't feel flimsy at all, and all the art is in incredibly high resolution. You'll definitely notice details you've never seen before. This section also has some unused art from the murals, where it was less stone engravings and it looked more like ancient Chinese art. Then it moves on to chapter 1, Artworks. 61 pages of official art. If you're a hardcore Tears fan, you've seen all of this before. Link crouching in the sky, splash pages of characters like Zelda and Ganon, basically all the character art you can see within the game itself is here. Even though there's nothing new here, it is fun to see it blown up quite large on nice paper. They've got the Link grabbing Zelda art from both launch day and one year later side by side, and they look spectacular. Near the page number, they do title the art, and these pages say, Official Art Posted on X in Japanese. I'm not sure how I feel about X being immortalized in my Zelda book, I do think it's funny that there is a splash page where Link is wearing his Zonai toga as the Sky Islands hover above him, and it is titled The Game Awards 2023 Visual. So Jeff Keighley must be very proud that the Game Awards is also immortalized in this book. Page 64 is where the real fun starts. Chapter 2, Making. This shows concept art, developer notes, and general background information on making the game. And yeah, it's most of the book, spanning pages 64 to 360. Sadly, 
I can't detail every single thing I saw on 300 pages, but I think the format is laid out very well and the information is easy to parse. Like the art section, we go through all the major characters one by one. Link has a few pages, then Zelda, then Ganondorf, and so on. Many sections have designer's notes, which gives more background information from the designers and artists of the game about how they went about creating the characters or artwork. These are some of my favorite sections of the book, as we really get into the designer's methods and get to break the fourth wall a little bit. It can get very granular, like explaining that Link would obviously have Hillian-style underpants in this game, as opposed to the Sheikah shorts in the last one. Obviously, the most eye-catching part of these pages filled with concept art is all the stuff they didn't use. We see many alternate designs for the Light Dragon, Zelda's Zona outfit had many variations, and when you get to the brand new characters, it's pretty amazing how different some are going to be. My favorite concept art section is easily Ganondorf, who had several radically different designs, but they all go hard. It did seem like they really latched onto the Japanese aesthetic early, explaining that they wanted to give him a design that was mixed with a samurai since they wanted to convey the sense that Ganondorf is somebody who fights alone, and also desert-style clothing inspired by the age of the Silk Road. So there's a few other Japanese-inspired designs here, including one where he looks more like a traditional oni, and some where he looks closer to Japanese gods like Bishamonten. Honestly, they really could have picked any of these, and they would have all been great, even the more wilder ones. I mean, I don't want to spend this whole segment just explaining every little piece of concept art, because there's just so much, from the characters to the places to the items. It's really impressive to see all these early and unused designs and how they still manage to convey the characters' personalities and traits. It's very clear that they had a strong foundation for them and were trying out different ways to bring them to life. And yes, the ancient heroes aspect has an entire page filled with official art and concept art. Is there any note explaining anything about it? Nope. Come on, give us something. There are also background pages which give a general overview of specific elements of the game. For example, one is about Link's abilities, one is about the clothing of Hyrule. Every now and then you'll come across a section called Secret File that features very rough sketches of gameplay concepts or scenes. I talked recently about the Earthbound and Dragon Quest 3 exhibit, where a lot of the planning was done by just scribbling stuff on paper, and yeah, that definitely still happens at Nintendo. Every great idea starts off on a napkin somewhere. The making section is incredibly comprehensive with some great details on how they ended up where they ended up, but I always feel like it could have been more. I want them to get really into the nitty gritty about every single design element, but you might just get a paragraph or two about something specific every now and then. Which are all great and insightful, but I do feel like there could have been more behind the scenes stuff when it came to how they finalized or thought up the designs. Like for example, there's a designer's note for Sonya, one of the more mysterious and important characters in the game. But the note mostly talks about trying to get her eyes right. They do mention that her markings are there to kind of make a connection between her and Zelda, but Lorehounds might get frustrated with how dodgy some of the explanations are. Making also includes storyboards of the geoglyph cutscenes, not just sketches, but we also see the formatting Nintendo uses when creating a scene like this, even detailing stuff like the time for each shot. All 12 scenes are included, so it's a very thorough look at how they actually created them. The section closes out with a bit more general concept art of excellent vistas and other scenes in the game. I think concept artists must be a fun job because it really does seem like you get a lot of freedom. Maybe the opposite is true, but I like to think that I'm right. The final section, history. Dozens of pages about the general lore, history, and culture of this Hyrule. Is there brand new information not mentioned in the game? Yes, but these mostly just flesh out existing ideas instead of outright retconning or confirming anything. Of course, there are multiple splash pages about the timeline. Now, is anything solved? Do we know exactly how it connects to the past games? Of course not. The timeline is literally the three goddesses created Hyrule, then Hylia appeared, squiggly lines, then Tears of the Kingdom starts. So there's a lot in that squiggly line. I always liked the convergence theory, where all timelines eventually ended up at the world of Breath of the Wild, but it's clear that these two games are a hard cut from most of the other titles, only lightly touching on the events of Skyward Sword and Ocarina of Time. Nintendo would never come out and say, this is the fourth timeline or a multiverse game, but it functionally is a game that almost takes place in its own version of the Zelda world. The history section mostly just has a lot of info I already knew, but then again, I am a crazy hardcore Zelda person who is interested in the lore and world building of Hyrule. So maybe I am not your average person who played Tears, but then again, I have to think this book is for people like me. An interesting or annoying element of some of the more mysterious tidbits from the game is that a lot of the history section is presented almost like it's written by a Hylian historian. So instead of hard facts, it's mostly speculation. 
But it is interesting that Nintendo is basically giving us multiple choice options for some stuff. For example, the book actually does address the long-discussed connection between the Zonai and the Barbarian tribe. Now, does it say what that connection is? No. But the book hypothesizes that the Barbarians were possibly Zonai who rebelled against authority, Zonai who didn't ascend to the sky, or Hylians who worshipped the Zonai instead of Hylia. These are at least interesting concepts to discuss and think about. But in general, the history section reads like an encyclopedia of this Hyrule. The final section of the book is a multi-page interview with Eiji Aonuma, Hidemaru Fujibayashi, and art director Satoru Takizawa. Here you get a lot of new info about the game's early development process and how they decided on what to implement and how. Just a ton of great little trivia bits here, like how the game was originally called Tears of the Dragon, and that Ultra Hand was basically the first concept they thought up, and how they came about creating the depths and so on. It's just as good as any developer interview Nintendo has put out. Now, the book has tons of info, and I'm sure there was a paragraph I missed or didn't pay attention to, but here are 10 fun factoids I learned from this book. One, dragons were a major motif early on in development. Like I said before, it was originally going to be called Tears of the Dragon. The idea of Link riding a dragon and even the final boss battle having the thematic concept of a white versus black dragon was thought up very early in the development stages. Two, the secret stones were originally supposed to resemble dragon fetuses. There's even concept art of the fetus stones, but the similar shape led them to changing it to the Japanese Magatama design. 3. Green was chosen as a color for the Zonai magic due to the readability in the game, the historic connection between your magic bar being green in past games, and to evoke the series past, since green is the most elemental color of the series. They go in depth about how they tried to fine-tune the perfect shades of green for the Zonai magic. 4. I said this earlier, but they do get into the connection between the Zonai and the Barbarians, but no concrete answer. They may have been Zonai or Hylians, but there is a gap of thousands of years between Raru's reign and the Barbarians. 5. It's confirmed that Ganondorf became both the Demon King and Calamity Ganon, so Calamity Ganon isn't the Ocarina of Time Ganon, for example. This is kind of a retcon, since I think it was supposed to be clear that Calamity Ganon was like a concentrated force of evil that's been forged over countless generations. Ganon has been defeated so many times, so all that's left is his raging spirit, unable to take form. The book also mentions that the Gerudo stopped the tradition of male kings after Ganondorf, supposing that either boys were never born again, or they purposefully hid them. 6. The book states that magic runs in the bloodline of the royal family, so Raru and Sonya must have had a child before the events of the game. Which is something a lot of people speculated upon, but it is kind of funny since that character would, lore-wise, be insanely important, but it's never touched upon in the game. 7. The shrine design is based on Shimanawa around boulders, which is a Shinto purification ritual. Shimanawa is a type of rope. They also designed the shrines to feel a bit more calm and open as opposed to the Shika shrines. We also see some alternate shrine designs. One is like a dragon mouth holding a ring. Another one is just a straight up Japanese torii gate. Eight, an early idea for the depths was based on kind of a lost world motif where it was filled with giant prehistoric plants and dinosaurs. They kind of folded this idea in with lighting up the dark. Nine, Hinoxes originally had much stranger fuse items on the top of their heads. There are multiple designs of them wearing hats made of metal, including a weird-looking top hat, and another design shows a giant cut diamond sitting on top of their heads. Maybe it would have been a little goofy to fight a top hat Hinox, but I think that would have ruled. 10. Like I said before, they basically had the concept for the final battle at the start, but the details came later. So, should you buy Masterworks? I mean, if you're like me, who thinks Tears of the Kingdom is likely the greatest game ever made, and I've played it more than any other single-player game ever, then yes. But in terms of what the book offers, it's an art book first, a dev diary second, then a lore dump third. So think about what you want out of the book most before buying it. And small side note, I do kind of wish they went backwards with these things. I'd love a Masterworks for like the Oracle games, for example. How well preserved are those documents? I'm not sure. But if Nintendo did retro Masterworks, that would be amazing. But anyways, that's all for games slash books. Let's move on to the news. We got a double whammy Nintendo Direct Partners Showcase in Indie World a few days ago. A very strange idea to match them together, since they're often not shy about doing one and then doing another the following week, but I do like this combined format better. Especially for Indies, since that gives them a bit more shine. I gotta be honest though, Indie World didn't really have a whole lot that caught my eye. Morsels, which is like an action roguelike, the vibrant art style, looks pretty neat, and Pizza Tower is a game I will probably pick up eventually, but the Partners Showcase had more for me. 
mostly just old games I've already played, but still. The best announcement? I mean, it's got to be Capcom Fighting Collection 2, yet another retro fighting game collection. But this one houses the greatest 2D fighting game ever, Capcom vs. SNK 2. I cannot believe it's finally coming, and so soon after the Megaton Marvel announcement. If you've never played CVS 2, it's what it sounds like, but it manages to really capture the gameplay elements of both Capcom and SNK, and offers a ton of customization when it comes to how you fight. It also includes the EO mode, which was what the Xbox and GameCube versions were based on, but sadly no GC-ism style, where you could do moves with the C-Stick. Honestly, I would have bought the collection just for this, but it also includes the two Power Stone games, which are amazing... I guess arena fighters? They're closer to Smash Brothers than not. I mean, I would have bought a CVS collection and a Power Stone collection separately, so it's fantastic that they're both here. There are also some other deep cuts in here too, like Alpha 3 Upper, which was a Japan-only version of my favorite Street Fighter game, and we get Project Justice, which is the sequel to Rival Schools, and Plasma Sword, the follow-up to Star Gladiator, aka the game Hayato from Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is from. The only dud is Capcom Fighting Evolution, but that game is at least interesting in its own right. I think this collection is way better than the first one, although there are some gems in that one too. I say it's even better than the Marvel collection, which is basically just MVC2 and a bunch of other games you're not going to touch. Pretty much every game here is something I want to spend time with, and playing CVS2 and Power Stone 2 online? That's all you need to say. No date yet except for 2025, but that's soon. Speaking of collections, Tetris Forever from Digital Eclipse was announced for this year. It's a collection of Tetris games including the NES version, Hatteras, Super Bombless, and apparently they didn't show every game included, so there might be some strange games hidden in here too. There's also a Tetris Time Warp, which swaps between the different versions. And it's part of Digital Eclipse's Gold series, meaning there are a lot of exclusive documentary videos. Seems like a very deep cut Tetris collection that I would pick up eventually. More old games, Suikoden 1 and 2 popped up again, and it will release March 6th. I'm a huge fan of Suikoden 3, it's one of my favorite PS2 titles, but I haven't touched 2, which many say is one of the best JRPGs ever, so I am definitely very curious to try it out. And a new version of an old game, The First Trails of the Sky, is being remade for Nintendo Switch and will launch next year. I actually have played this game, but only for about an hour. I bought it for cheap on Steam, played some of it, enjoyed it, but at that time I thought, I'm not in the mood to start a JRPG. So I guess I should redeem myself by picking up this remake. As I get older, I start to realize that it's getting impossible to play every single JRPG I'm interested in, but if I can at least play one game from every series, I'll be content. Speaking of JRPGs, we have Atelier Yumiya, the newest game in the Atelier franchise. Move over, Ryza, you've been replaced by a mini-skirted, high-heeled heroine. I'm not an Atelier hardcore, so it's hard to tell what's new just from the gameplay, but it certainly looks more action-focused. However, it seems to be confirmed that it's not an action RPG, but the attacks look very dynamic and vibrant. It definitely looks fantastic for a Switch game, and I've seen people speculating that this is secretly a Switch 2 launch title. However, it was announced that it is coming out in March, so I don't know if Switch 2 will be that soon. I enjoyed Atelier Ryza 1, but playing 2 and 3 does kind of feel like homework, but I might jump back into the series with a newer protagonist. But back to old games, Castlevania Dominus Collection is out now, which is the 3DS Castlevania games. I played some of Don Nassaro, and sorry, I really can't get into these games. I mean, I like Metroid, so I should like this one, right? I also like Castlevania 4, which is not a Metroidvania, but still. But Nintendo did not deem this the most important old game, as Yakuza Kiwami is coming to Switch. This is the first Yakuza title on Nintendo hardware since the Japan-only Yakuza 1 Plus 2 HD on the Wii U. The game infamously sold incredibly poor, and it's rumored that it soured the relationship between RGG Studios and Nintendo, but time heals all wounds, as does selling 150 million units. Kind of makes sense to start with, quote, Yakuza 1, but I think most agree that Zero is a much better entry point. And many said that Kiwami's new content kind of frames itself as a sequel to Zero, and less Zero being a prequel to One. Zero is a fantastic game, while Kiwami is basically a souped-up version of a mid-2000s game, so I do think not just launching with Zero, which was on the PS3, is a missed opportunity. But I do imagine all these games will be coming to Switch 2 one day. There were some Japan-only announcements, like Stray Children Got a Date, and also Tokimeki Memorial, the first game, is coming to Nintendo Switch. Overall, it was a pretty decent Nintendo Direct. I mean, I'm mostly excited about a 20-year-old fighting game coming back, but what a fighting game. 
People are speculating about why Nintendo had a rare August Direct, and one that didn't focus on Nintendo first-party games. September General Directs have been the pattern, so people are wildly speculating about Switch 2 getting revealed in September or October. I mean, it'll be announced when it's announced. We already know Nintendo's schedule for this year, the only question mark is Q1 2025, and we at least have one game confirmed then. But I am thinking we get a General Direct before Donkey Kong comes out. We've been getting new Echoes of Wisdom updates, including a video highlighting the still world, or Muno Sekai, which means the world of nothingness in Japanese, the purpley area Link fell into. Zelda can also enter this world via special passages in the overworld. It does feel like the depths in some ways, since there are specific entry points. Not sure if it's one big interconnected world, or each entry point is its own little section. I first theorized these rifts were like shrine equivalents, but it seems more than that, and there are even dungeons you can discover in here. I'll always think it's funny that recently people have been skeptical about Dungeons and Zelda games, a franchise where literally every game has dungeons. They also showed off a sword fighter form where Zelda can essentially turn into Link and bash things with the sword. Not sure how I feel about this, since the whole idea of the game is that you are different from Link and need to solve problems in other ways. But it is a limited time power up, so it's not like you can just use it anywhere or at any time. I did see someone note that Link is a sword fighter so he can use weapons freely, but has limited magic. But Zelda is more magic adept, thus her sword fighting is more limited. And yeah, that's kind of a fun way to think about it. Oh, and the latest trailer teased a battle with Link, which is a really fun idea. We fought Dark Link before, but a Link Link battle? I'm hoping they go all out with this one. PlayStation 5. It's expensive. And now it's going to get even more expensive in Japan. The new price for the disc version is 79,980 yen, a 19% increase from the previous price. Also note that the previous price itself was a price increase. The launch price was 49,980 yen, so it's gone up 30,000 yen in four years. The price increase alone is about as much as a switch. Sony cited global economic conditions for the price increase. The yen is doing very bad right now, so people are paying less for PS5s in Japan than they are in America. However, for Japanese people, 80,000 yen does feel like $800. Keep that in mind. Japanese people get paid in yen, so don't think, well, now the PS5 is equal to the price in America, because while that may technically be true due to the fluctuating conversion rate, for Japanese people, the PS5 is now priced out of their typical range for a console. There's absolutely a set of people who are just purely waiting for Monster Hunter, and I do wonder how much the inflated price is going to affect sales of that game in Japan, where the franchise still sells millions of units. Will Monster Hunter hardcores just swallow the cost and buy a PS5 at the new price, or will there be a mad dash to buy cheaper PS5s right now? This is a real long shot, but if Switch 2 can come out and say, we have Wilds, or at least announce a new Monster Hunter is coming, that would be an insane boon to the new system and a dagger to PS5's growth in Japan. It is really sad to see how far PlayStation has fallen when it comes to appealing to Japanese gamers. I honestly don't think it can be turned around in Japan, as Sony focuses more on Western markets. And some sad news, but Wizardry co-creator Andrew Greenberg has passed away. With Robert Woodhead, he created the original Dungeon Crawler, a game that has had an enormous impact on the gaming industry, especially on the Japan side. Go listen to my past Wizardry episode, where I actually got to interview Mr. Woodhead. But in short, the game heavily inspired Dragon Quest, which heavily inspired, you know, every JRPG. But even as a game, it really is a classic, and the Digital Eclipse remaster from earlier this year really highlights how strong the original game design is still to this day. Greenberg left the gaming industry many years ago, going into law, but he will always be an important part of gaming history. Last bit of news, Indie Cube, the developers of Mario Party and many other games, is now Nintendo Cube. Yes, Nintendo Cube. That's their name. The rebrand is similar to Mario Club and 1UP Studio, and their logo looks exactly like those two companies. The name Indie Cube comes from their initial investors, Nintendo, and Japanese company Dentsu. Dentsu no longer has any shares of Indie Cube, or they only have a very small minority share, since Nintendo controls 99% of the company. I'm not sure if this is going to be a trend. I don't know if we are going to see Nintendo Monolith anytime soon. But it is going to be strange to say, oh, this is a Nintendo Cube developed game. I wonder if the new name and logo will appear in Super Mario Party Jamboree. It might be worth buying just to see that. All right, let's wrap it up. Thanks as always for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app. Leave a five-star review as well. It helps with visibility. This podcast is also available on YouTube, so like and subscribe there as well. I'm on Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, Instagram. Just search Tokyo Game Life or find the links in the podcast description. If you like the podcast, 
be sure to share with your friends and on social media. If there's anything you want me to talk about or cover, don't be shy. Just message me on Twitter. The next episode will be on September 22nd. See you next time. Matinee.